Well, folks, we've made it through another year. 2024 was a year of highs and lows for the video game industry, containing a record number of layoffs and studio closures, but also a huge glut of quality game releases. I finally played through Tunic, the stunning homage to old school Zelda, starring a cool little fox. I tiptoed my way through the claustrophobic confines of Signalis, a brilliant helping of retro survival horror. Crypt Custodian was a late year surprise, offering up a cozy, melancholy Metroidvania with one of my favorite soundtracks of the year. But we're not here for the honorable mentions, we're here for my top 10 video games of 2024. A couple of important notes before we begin the list. Firstly, this is not a comprehensive best of the year list. These are my personal favorite games. Secondly, a game does not have to have been released this year to qualify for the list. As long as I played and finished the game in the year 2024, it's eligible. All right, with that out of the way, let's count down my top 10 games of 2024. So that's Banzer. Strange place, I know, but they need what we're selling, see? Let me tell you, I love video games. Of course I do, but sometimes, if I'm being honest, they can take themselves a little too seriously. In between the battles and apocalypses, it's nice to play something that remembers to laugh at itself. Thank goodness you're here does just that. The game is a pretty simplistic adventure title. You play as a chipper little balding man who manages to get involved in the business of just about every resident of a quaint British town. It's your job to help each resident with their needs, which become increasingly absurd as the game progresses. The actual game Gameplay of Thank Goodness You're Here is straightforward, but it works for the kind of experience the game is trying to present. You explore small sections of the town, one at a time, until you figure out what needs to be done to progress to the next area. It's just fun, but what elevates the proceedings even higher is the game's stellar presentation. From the vibrant art to the authentic, at times incomprehensible voice acting, every piece of the game is clearly crafted with copious care and attention. Beyond that, it's one of the funniest games I've played in recent memory. Games very rarely make me laugh, but this one managed to get more than a few chuckles out of me. Thank goodness you're here is simple, succinct, and genuinely unique. A lovely combination that helps it slide into the top 10. Yeah, thanks for that. This is the story of a man named Stanley. Oh man, where to begin with the Stanley Parable? Despite it being on the market for over a decade, I'd never played the game until 2024. It's a real gamer's game, if such a thing exists, as it's an incredibly sharp commentary on the medium as a whole. The more familiar you are with video games, the more you'll get out of this experience. You play as Stanley, a voiceless, mundane pencil pusher who one day decides to get up from his desk. From there, you begin exploring your abandoned office building, accompanied by some colorful commentary. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, and Stanley knew it perfectly well. Perhaps he wanted to stop by the employee lounge first, just to admire it. As you walk around, this disembodied narrator begins instructing what you should do next. If you follow his advice, you can complete the game in short order, but if you don't, things start to get interesting. Gifting Stanley with autonomy leads to dozens of various paths that lead into completely unpredictable scenarios, and since this is the ultra-deluxe version of the game, there's even more content than was present originally. I'd say more, but this is absolutely a game best experienced as blindly as possible. If any of this sounds intriguing, trust me, The Stanley Parable is a must-play. I've got plenty of experience with From Software, but the game that really laid the groundwork for what we now know as a Souls-like has always remained a blind spot for me. Thankfully, in 2020, Bluepoint Games released a remake of Demon's Souls, the From classic that originally launched all the way back in 2009. In 2024, I finally got around to playing it. This is a complete graphical overhaul of the OG and is honestly one of the best looking games I've played on the PS5. The Souls-like formula is pretty well understood at this point, but it was interesting to travel backward and play through a less refined form of what From Software has evolved this genre into today. For example, the game's primary levels are completely separate from one another and only accessible through a small hub world. This structure is a far cry from your Dark Souls and your Elden Rings and actually holds the game back from placing higher on this list. Again, though, it's cool to retroactively witness the growth of this developer. The nuts and bolts of what makes these games so great are largely still intact here, and the stunning fresh coat of paint is a hugely impactful enhancement. Ultimately, Demon's Souls is a great game and makes me even more excited to see what From Software and Bluepoint are cooking up next. 
If I could use one word to describe Pentiment, it would be fibrous. Now, I know that's a strange description of a video game, but it feels apt. There's a certain density to Pentiment that I think may turn a lot of people off. The game is very slow-paced, predicated on conversation and investigation. It's a style that many may find unappealing and might not even have worked for me were it not executed so well. Pentiment places you in the shoes of Andreas Mailer, a traveling artist who finds himself at the center of various murders taking place in a fictional German town. It's your job to try and deduce who's responsible for the grisly crimes while also developing genuine relationships with the people around you. Uniquely, the game is set over multiple decades, which really enables you to see the long-term consequences of the choices you make. Despite its storybook-inspired art style, Pentiment is surprisingly grounded. I felt truly immersed in its world thanks to its sharp, clever writing and unwavering commitment to storytelling. It's a fascinating game about people, place, theology, and the unavoidable ways in which all of these things are morphed by time. It's not for everyone, but serves as an unforgettable experience for those willing to open the book. Speaking of unforgettable, Inscription is a game unlike anything else I've ever played. That statement alone should pique your interest, given how many games I've played, but without solid execution to back up the innovation, you're left with a missing ingredient. Thankfully, Inscription delivers both in droves. The game finds you in some kind of mysterious cabin. You appear to be trapped against your will, however, your shadowy captor seeks not to bring harm, but rather to serve cards. That's right, Inscription finds you dueling and deck building in equal measure. This isn't a genre of game that I've historically been interested in, but I try to push myself out of my genre comfort zone from time to time, and in this case, I'm really glad that I did. I won't dig into the minutiae of the card game here, but just know that it's easy to learn while still providing a high skill ceiling. Before long, I was addicted and constantly thinking about when I could go back to the game. Pulling me into a deck builder would be impressive in its own right, but Inscription goes even further. The game also presents an escape room of sorts that you play concurrently with the card battles. There's an overarching narrative that transcends the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay that I was entirely unprepared for. Similarly to the Stanley Parable, Inscription seems hell-bent on surprising you. Beyond the addictive gameplay and wonderfully bizarre art style, Inscription's strongest element is its progression. This is a game completely willing to reinvent itself at a moment's notice, narratively, mechanically, and even stylistically. I don't want to say much more, but just trust me when I tell you that this is a game you need to play. If the last couple of games on this list illustrate how much I value narrative, style, and innovation, then Tiny Tina's Wonderlands highlights how much I value fun. In many ways, this game is relatively by the numbers, no pun intended, but when it came time for me to determine my 10 favorites of the year, I couldn't deny just how much fun I had playing it, and isn't that what video games are all about? Wonderlands is a spin-off to the Borderlands franchise, focusing on one of its more notorious characters, Tiny Tina, hosting a D&D match with some of her friends. It's a very different premise to what's come before, but any Borderlands fan will be right at home with the gameplay on offer. Shooting and looting remain the name of the game, and the gunplay feels as tight as ever. I'm a fan of the series, but there was something about Borderlands 3 that left me feeling a bit underwhelmed. Waterlands completely reverses my lukewarm state, and I think it may be the reinvented premise that does it. Because you're in the middle of a D&D &D match, the world can change around you in real time at Tina's whim. She's calling the shots here, which means you never have any idea where you're going to end up next. This willingness to ditch the tired lands of Pandora genuinely makes what's largely a very safe game feel decidedly fresh. Borderlands 4 is due out next year, and given the quality of Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, it's got a lot to live up to. Every year, I end up playing a few games that it turns out I grossly underestimated. In 2024, Ghostwire Tokyo was one of those games. I mean, I expected to like it. It was created by Tango Gameworks, one of my favorite developers, and certainly looked fun, but I ended up loving this game way more than I expected to. 
Ghostwire is an open world action game where you have to exercise the various demonic spirits that have invaded Tokyo in an effort to save your comatose sister. Most of your time is spent engaging in combat and exploring the city, which are both fun in equal measure. The game is ostensibly a first person shooter, but feels unique relative to what you may expect. Once each enemy has received enough damage, you have to destroy their respective core to fully eliminate them. This is an incredibly satisfying act to execute and never grew tiresome for me, even after I'd done it hundreds of times. With all the massive, sprawling open-world games that flood the industry, it's nice to play one like this that carves out its own niche. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty to see and do here, but the game never overwhelms you with content or mechanics. This game didn't seem to sell very well at all, so I'd venture to guess there's a good chance that you haven't played it. If it looks like it would be up your alley, grab a ticket to Tokyo and start doing this. I've been waiting for you, Mr. Winters. Resident Evil is debatably my favorite video game franchise, so anytime I jump into a new entry, it's a big deal. I was incredibly excited to finally jump into what's technically the franchise's eighth mainline game, and I'm happy to report that Resident Evil Village largely delivered everything I could have hoped for. The story serves as a direct sequel to 7, and is probably my least favorite part of the game. That being said, some of the narrative moments in Village reflect impressive storytelling growth for Resident Evil. We just gotta get ourselves a more interesting protagonist for the next go-around. Everything else in the game leaves little more to be desired. The gunplay feels great, the progression system is much deeper than 7, and the Duke has gotta be one of the best characters in series history. The real star of Village, though, is the game's world. Exploring the snowy wastes of this mysterious community was an absolute joy from beginning to end. I made a whole video lavishing praise on this game's world, so if you're looking for more detailed thoughts, I'd recommend giving that one a watch. To be honest, I expected Resident Evil Village to be my game of the year when I started it, which really speaks to the quality of the two titles that topped it. Let's see how special you are. Historically, I haven't really been a fan of the Ratchet & Clank franchise. I played the 2016 reboot and thought it was okay, but man, Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart completely blew my mind. This is another game that I've already made another video about, and I'll say here what I said there, this game is just plain fun. Fun is a concept that some modern games seem to forget about on occasion. Don't get me wrong, I still have fun playing games all the time, no question, but Rift Apart clearly prioritizes that word above all else. It was just refreshing to play a game so sincere and earnest. Par for the franchise course, Rift Apart finds you traveling all over the galaxy in an effort to stop the plotting of the not-so-intimidating Dr. Nefarious. This manifests in copious third-person shooting, brawling, and platforming as you progress through the main quest. The level design is sharp, the incredibly varied arsenal feels great to use, and there's a really satisfying progression system that enables you to upgrade your weapons. It was one of those games that compelled me to do everything I could. Even after acquiring the Platinum Trophy, I would have happily kept playing it if I didn't have so many other games to get to. Thanks to this and their Spider-Man games, Insomniac has quickly become one of my favorite developers. Hopefully, even with all their Marvel obligations, the team can still find time for some more Ratchet & Clank. Rift Apart is an absolute blast and was only able to be surpassed by one other game. Every year when I craft my top 10 list, I think about what qualities are most important to me in a video game. Is it the story? The gameplay? The value? They're all important to me and these various priorities are strewn all around the games we've already discussed, but something about Norco managed to transcend them all. Norco isn't as long as many of these other games, it's not as flashy or popular, but ultimately, none of that mattered. Set in a dystopian, futuristic Norco, Louisiana, the game follows Kay, who returns to the city after learning that her mother, Catherine, has died of cancer. You'll actually play as both women, with Kay's story set in the present day, and Catherine's set a few months prior. Norco is ostensibly a point-and-click adventure game, which isn't a genre that I'm generally very interested in. Like Inscription, though, Norco compelled me to give it a chance, 
and I'm so glad that I did. The world of the game is just so engrossing, assisted greatly by the moody and mysterious soundtrack. The writing is top tier, breathing life into countless memorable characters, and playing host to perhaps the funniest video game exchange I've ever witnessed. Seriously, a video game has never made me laugh as hard as this one did. There are so many disparate parts of such a high quality, but I think what ultimately made me love this game so much is just how effectively it sucked me into its world, managing to do so without a single polygon or voiced line of dialogue. Norco was the very first game I played this year, and those winter nights where I explored and conversed until the wee hours of the morning are some of my favorite gaming sessions of recent memory. Norco is just special, and my favorite game of 2024.